Welcome to a special edition of the Calling It Rant. I'm Sly. And I'm, I thought we retired, Spook. <laughs> I wish we could retire. Spook, we didn't do a rant on the Collingwood, the Geelong final. Why was that? Why, can you remind me why we didn't do it? Uh, going in, were you confident? Um, yeah, they pulled me in a little bit. But yeah, um, I thought we'd um, probably at least turn up for five minutes. So, somebody reliable told me... Was it uh, Sam Endermanson? No. Somebody told me that in the lead up to that game... Nathan Buckley decided to revert game plans. Did he? And there did, might have did been... He, did he pick the shit one? Yeah, so he decided to go back to the, the chip and backwards and that sort of shit. And one of the players, I won't name who it was, let's just nickname him the captain. He went to Buckley and had issues with it and that caused a little bit of a kerfuffle. Did it? It would, it would have been hard to see. It was a kerfuffle. I'm just uh, verbally... I'm actually curious because, like, watching that game, I was thinking they just look tired and flat and that, like, they have nothing left. But now, after hearing this, I was thinking, you know, maybe they just were a little bit disheartened and they seem to have no cohesion or focus. They really played like they had totally been deflated of any will to live, like many of our supporters in the, in the crowd. It was just, it was, I mean, do we have to really talk about this? No, I just meant, yeah, I thought we'll quickly was, touch on it was woefully dismal and and to be that flat across the board there has to be some merit in the fact that that season why it had to pick that week to, it just caught up with them that would have to be the logical way of looking at it even if the Bucks rumour was true do you think it had destabilised the whole playing group to, to churn out a performance like that? I don't think that's to destabilise the whole playing group I think it's to destabilise like you know four or five people you destabilize the engine room there's nothing the defenders of the forwards can do that's it they they're out of it uh they look pretty listless i mean maybe it's a combination of things but i just found that interesting you know uh speaking to phantom and he was saying well if there's one team that the old game plan does well against it is actually geelong mm. but then again you look at the way we played against the west coast you think well if you just play that style all the time you're probably gonna back yourselves in most times against most clubs Anyway, I think the the Cats played exceptionally well that day, and they're worthy premiers. Yeah. Uh, Richmond. <laughs> Do we have to? Three flags in... I don't want to hear this. Four years. Oh, I don't want to hear this. And you've been following them for 50 years, so... How many have you seen? <laughs> Two. How many grand finals have you seen? Can I, can I count a couple of the night grand finals? I might as well. Well, there's only one win there, so <laughs> if you've seen three... No, we didn't win one in the 80s, didn't we? Yeah, only the one. And the one in... Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that one. I was going to remember the one we lost. Yes, I thought that was the obvious one you'd forgotten. No. Um, yeah. So, following Collingwood, who's full of bluster and, you know, all that sort of shit. Definitely shit. To see them surpassed by Richmond, one of the traditional old rivals, how does it make you feel about this club and its bluster that, hey, we're still the greatest? At this point, I'm going to choose to get a vomit sound effect and play it instead. All right, let me ask you something else, because I remember you were pretty angry about this. I was pissed off about it too. How great is it that we beat Richmond in the prelim in 218, oh, stopping fuck. their four in a row? Seriously, there's nothing more annoying than reading people glorifying failure. Now, it's not failure in terms of we won that game, but what does it matter when we didn't fucking win the following week? Now, you brought it up, and, and, and I would have brought it up as well at any rate, but that 1958 flag side, that's stopping a fucking run. That has meaning because you won the grand final doing it. Winning a game that ended up ultimately meaning nothing is nothing to celebrate and nothing to throw in front of anyone's fucking face. Do you think there's one Richmond supporter out there that's tearing up because they didn't get that fourth flag over the three that they've seen? Well, the other thing too is you actually trying to impose meaning on something because at that stage Richmond were on one flag they won two and three after that prelim so you're sort of retrospectively saying oh look we stopped you four 
Well, you don't know what would have happened if Richmond beat us in the prelim in 218. They might have fallen over against West Coast. They might have won and celebrated in 219 and four. You don't know anything. So you're actually trying to impose meaning on a situation that's actually meaningless. I, I, I fucking hate this. And like I've had arguments with people about, hey, why do you celebrate something that means nothing? You got nowhere. But this is a lot of where we are as a club now. We, we it's, have, but it's we, not we, just we, now. It's, it's been about 50, 60 years of this shit. We have nothing to hang our hats on. Two flags in 70 years. It, it, it's not an imposing, threatening statement to make to people. Well, this is the other issue I have, and you know we've been saying this for quite a while, even before we started this uh, podcast. For at least 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about like 20 years. You run around celebrating this club for all these meaningless things. Why would you find the ability to go above and beyond and win a flag when you're just being celebrated for fucking existing regardless? It's something that just boggles me. You know, it's ridiculous to think we celebrate things that other people just laugh at. And we still run around like we're the greatest. We're a nothing club. We're still, we're not, you know, now, I'm actually glad Richmond's passed us because you can no longer hide behind the illusion that we're a great club or a great Victorian club or whatever. Richmond's well, well past us. Carlton's going to probably pass us pretty soon. The only club that's as deluded as us is Essendon, and they're spiraling out of control. So, it's a results-driven competition, people. It should, you know, put in perspective where exactly we stand. And in terms of, you know, if you want to just look at members and shit like that, West Coast has got more members than us. Adelaide, I, I know it's a two-state, no, a two-team state. It doesn't matter. You can't run around going, oh, we've got all these members. Richmond's now got more than you. Richmond's got more flags in the AFL era than you have. You know, they're not up to our 15, but they're on 13, and they could still win another one or two with that squad. You hate to admit it. The only time, you know, and I saw an article up on the Raw which talked about dynasties and what was the strongest dynasty. I think it's one of the better Kiss albums. <laughs> if you look at, like, the three or four clubs that have won three or more flags, so Hawthorne's won four, Geelong's won the three from memory, and... Brisbane won three in a row, and now Richmond's won three. And you think, to put together the right coaching staff, the right list, and for it all to come together in terms of timing and all that, it takes an extraordinary amount of both planning and luck. Because, you know, for a lot of these lists, you just don't know who might come up. You know, you go back to like, 10, 15, 15 years ago, nobody ever would have thought that Swan would be, Dane Swan would be like a premier midfielder. And that's sort of talk about luck. You know, you pick these guys thinking they're going to be good players. It takes luck for them to go to the next level. Um, we only got it right once. And what did we do with that squad? I think we dismantled it 12 months later. Yeah, well, that's a good thing to do. List management. Do we have some? How are you feeling about Adam Trelaw? Jeez, this hasn't been handled particularly well, has it? Oh, I'm and, not, and, and the more and more it comes out each day, it, it's it's just looking worse and worse. It's not a great look. Now, look, I, I don't mind them trading Trelaw away. The means in which it's being um, handled and played out in the public is, is borderline appalling. Well, the, the, what would you say to... And I, I agree with you. I, I Trade anyone. I, don't, I actually don't care. As long as you get value for them, if you trade them... We'll get our first two rounds picks back. And, and I'll actually go back to the trade that this administration's done, which I thought was borderline criminal, is the Jared Witts one, which who they traded to Gold Coast for like a pick 60 or something. I thought that was absurd. You, you got a seven foot tall Ruckman who's um, had several years in the system and you're trading him for a pick 60 or whatever it was. I know, I'm amazed we just can keep him and put him, uh, try and turn him into a Ford. Jeez, that's unusual. So I don't care who you trade as long as you get value for them or even more than they're worth. But this troll all things ha- being handled appallingly. How would you feel about people who say, oh, well, hey, the club doesn't have to say anything. They don't have to answer these scurrilous rumours. In, in some respects, the, the club is almost doing the right thing. It has that policy, I think, I read or heard or something where it said that if there's nothing to say, say nothing. But the trouble is, is the more that they don't say sometimes, the more the, the rumour mill becomes um, relevant to the point of being truthful. Um, you saw what happened today with Sam Edmondson with his um, statement quoting Bucks as um, 
that he spoke to Trelaw during the week and and told him that the the playing uh, the leadership group don't want him around anymore. Um, that he smells and he's uh, got foot odor and halitosis apparently as well. Um, and that's now sort of um, not now, but it did sort of sound like it was becoming fact. I was annoyed when I read that, and then Buckley, to his credit. Um, tweeted about half an hour later that it was um, Bupkus. However, though, he's still confirmed by um, loose association that they're, they're still clearly obviously open to, to moving him on. Well, Sam Edmund responded <clears throat> and he took a shot back at Buckley. Did he? I didn't know about this. What yeah, happened? So I, he just said, well, I don't want to name my source, but if I did, nah. No, that's a standard comeback from these gunner journalists, though. Look, I, I, I have a source. It's like the the Caro one a couple of months ago where she was at nah, a function. They're, and, they're just doing and, it. I can't tell you who the source is, though. I do all this stuff. I can tell you all this stuff, except I can't tell you who told it to me. I The club should, should have got in front of this days ago. I think it's way too late now. Um, and my biggest query with this, which we've talked about, is if you get a player who's chosen your club to play for your club, and who's back into his salary to help you bring in such stellar names like Dane Beams and Daniel Wells. <laughs> you, and this guy is a good soldier as far as we know. There might be stuff we don't know. And then you're saying, well, you no longer serve our purpose, you're out. What are the players in the existing playing group thinking? Oh, what are the people that you want to, them to come to the club going to think? And, and the smart one. What are, you know, the next big thing? Let's say Matt Rowell in two years goes, well, I want to leave. Who am I going to go to? You go, oh, Colin goes, here's a five-year deal. And then, like, he's going, well, I saw the way you treated Trelaw, so fuck that. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a distinct possibility, but... I Look, the, we don't, okay, so we don't know anything. We don't know, I mean, Colin has said, you know, they have doubts about um, whether Trelaw can handle being away from his partner. It's, I'd say there is an element of honest truth around that. Um, I did read that that's actually discrimination, so they can actually, actually open themselves up to a lawsuit. But if that's the stance they're taking... I would have thought that Collingwood's first option should have been, okay, how do we work through this in terms of how do we make this work and keep you at the club? Would you think about giving his wife a job in their netball team? Well, that would be one of the options. Um, too easy. Too easy. One of the other options too would just be to turn around to law and say, look, sorry, we're over fucking spending. If you want to renegotiate your contract, we'll talk about it. Well, when, so just on that though, when, when did this five-year thing get announced? Was it ever announced? I don't recall it ever being announced. It's just, it's just come up suddenly. And, who, and it's the same with the Stevenson thing I read today that um, he's been given another two years to 2023. Was that announced last year? It was done last year? Oh, I don't recall. I think it was mentioned this year, but yeah. I, what are they doing? The Trelaw one is the one that annoys me. No, no disrespect in terms of the Trelaw. In 218, he tore both hamstrings off yeah. the fuck, off, off his leg. And it's like, someone's got... That, well, wouldn't, that, wouldn't have, that wouldn't have put up any sort of warning signs, would it? Let's give him five years. I think, I think five years would be good for him. And he's had other soft tissue injuries in that time, minor ones. But you'd have to look at it and go, well, especially... And this is what kills me at this club. You have Trelaw tear both hamstrings. And like one was like right off the bone or whatever. So he missed 12 weeks or whatever it was. This is coming after you had a young gun recruit in Nathan Freeman do pretty much the same injury, which just dragged on and on, and you never were able to fix it to a satisfaction of getting him into the system. And he had to go to St Kilda, and he was probably a shadow of what he could have been. So you have this history. No one at the club has sort of seen Trelaw tear both hamstrings and have a season in 019 where you're sort of going, well, he's not really hitting full pace. Who the fuck at the club turned around and goes, well, this is probably the time to give him five years. And, he, and he's 27, so you're carrying him on to 32. Who the fuck, play, besides Pendlebury, who's really showed longevity at Collingwood? But this, doesn't this sort of highlight that, that disjointedness between who's actually... Where's, where's the buck stopping in this club? Someone's making these decisions and is someone ratifying these decisions? Now, my understanding loosely is something that I read... Um, the other day that, that, that that's part of what the board is there to do when you not so much um, to sit there and say you ought to give him X amount of time or whatever but once a deal would surely be in that close proximity to agreement wouldn't you present it to the board to say are you signing off on this and I'm just saying that you know it's, 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 it's that responsibility that rests there or anything like that but surely there's got to be some intermingling of is this a good idea um, someone that actually looks at this and says, are we happy with this? Because surely 
you'd look at this logically from the outside and say, five years for a bloke who's borderline... Look, the, the, the way I'd be... Look, I'm terrible with money. Okay, I'm horrible. Well, I can just... you change this 50 bucks? Yeah, sure. Here's 100. Um, I know nothing about money. I know nothing about finances, but I would have thought if I'm running a club, I'd be sitting down and I'd have a plan for each year over the next five years to say, these are the players we've got this year. These are the players that we're going to have next year, and this is what they're being, uh, what they're making. These are the guys getting re-signed next year, and this is the range that we're looking to, to re-sign them in. And this is all going to try and sit within the salary cap. And in the following year, this is what we see we might be paying these players. And I'd be trying to judge it year by year to say, how are we sitting within the salary cap? Where do we need to sacrifice players? Okay, someone like a Beams comes along. Okay, we're going to fit him in this year, but next year it's just going to be a clusterfuck. It's better not to get him because it'll just be a mess in two years' time. And similarly, if you know, oh, in two years' time, you've got to re-sign Darcy Moore and Jordan Degoe, and then you've got to re-sign Stevenson and Grundy, or whatever the case. I would have thought they would have had a five-year plan year by year and taken into allowance the capacity to which they might pay them and working through all that, looking at who they could bring into the club and how much they could possibly pay them and who they can re-sign for what. They just seem to be operating on the premise of, oh, well, this is what we're paying this year and that's it. That's all we know. And we'll just back into everything and juggle it from next year. Well, I think the, the, the key word there is the juggling side of things. Yeah, I don't think it's ever as plain as, as what the, the media report that Player X is on 800k a year and each year he's going to get paid 800k. Oh, it's not. I mean, Trelaw's getting back into so yeah. he got paid a lot less. I, I, and I wouldn't think that's a unique situation there because you've obviously, you've got to project against X amount of players that you think probably won't be on the list next year or the year after. Those that are scheduled to retire. Um, but this is what I'm saying. They should have a plan year by year for the next five years no, at I least. I don't think they... you can use the word plan in calling <laughs> But And this is, you know, you got to this point. All right, so let's go back to the Beams deal. All right. You picked him up. Fine. Then you had the one year later, you had to get rid of James H. And now you're looking at people like Phillips and Cox and Trelaw leaving because of salary cap. And they're talking about James Stevens and all that sort of I stuff. I don't understand how we have a salary cap issue. And so how did no one see this two years ago? And yeah, then, but we've had a salary cap issue now for years. And then you take, It just never goes away. You're taking into consideration what you just said. You've done fucking nothing for how long? You've gotten the one grand final and one prelim. And suddenly you're bursting at the seams and need a fire sale. Richmond's won three flags in four years. I remember when they got Tom Lynch. Players took a pay cut to fit him in. What the fuck is this club doing? Nah, I don't know. And then there was a similar thing to to, to what Geelong did as well. They all took haircuts to to try and keep their list as, uh, together as long as possible. Now, you wouldn't look back to, to Essendon's fire sales after the... Uh, to, to 2000 where they couldn't keep their list together any longer because they, they fucked up the cap you wouldn't look at history and try and learn from it would you but then again this is what I'd be saying at least they plan- want a flag to have that fucking reason well you sure you'd be planning this out uh, it, much more meticulously than you've planned it out well this goes back to what I was saying before that is that when you and that was just a, a, a singular example of, of, of a contractual review but surely this has to be ratified at, 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 a, at a number of levels to make sure that it that, the, that all the i's are dotted and the t's are crossed and it just doesn't seem to have that externally at least it doesn't seem to have that cohesiveness as it should be having we seem to have um a lot of firing from the hip um decisions made and somewhere, well, okay, so in this case something- someone is trying then to to come back and sort of fix it okay and, and this goes to what i've said for a while all right, so about 10 years ago, Brendan Gale came out and had that plan for Richmond, and we all laughed, and they fulfilled it. As I said before, Hawthorne's got the 2050 blueprint. And I showed you an article where like, they compared plans of clubs, and Collingwood outright said, we don't have a plan, we just go from year to year. You wouldn't... Um, you wouldn't be able to tell, would you? No, you wouldn't at all. And this is oh, like, That comes as a surprise, to be honest. And this is like, you read the message boards and you talk with people... No one knows where the fuck they're going next year. Are we rebuilding? Are we contending? Are we trying to rebuild on the run? No one knows what's happening because the club doesn't know what's happening. And they've done this since Buckley took over. I'm not blaming Buckley. I'm just saying the club in general has had a total problem with their vision and what they're doing. And then they've done things like fucked up on the drafts with Kennedy and Freeman and Scharenberg and all those sort of guys. And then they've been forced to overpay for guys like Trelaw to try and catch up to their shit list management. And now they're at a place where you like you got this weird juxtaposition in the list where you got some really good young guns, but then you got this really a, a very important older core with Howe and Sidebottom and Pendlebury. 
once they go, I don't know who the fuck's going to replace them. And this list has a potential to, for the bottom and drop out. I thought this was going to happen in 06, 07, because you had guys like Buckley and Burns and Lecuria and Rocker and Clement and, and Wakeland all, all ready to go. But they had drafted so well that they had Daisy and Pendles and Beams and Sidebottom and Reed Brown. Yep. They had them all ready to come in and these guys were getting games. So the transition was really, really seamless. And then... I thought after 206 that, well, we're going to just hit rock bottom for a couple of years while we rebuild. We didn't miss the finals and won the flag in 2010. I don't know where the fuck this club sits right now. I don't know what they're doing. You hear about all these players who are potentially outgoing and you don't hear about anyone really incoming. The only guy they've been linked with is Tom McDonald, who I'll get to later. What do you think about the Jaden Stevenson? Possibly he's on the trade table. That, that would be an absolute fucking disaster to do that. You've seen what this kid's capable of. Now, you can excuse the, the gambling year because he missed a lot of football. As you said during um, this season, the glandular fever clearly can knock you around in, in several different ways that would impact his game. I think it was good that they kept playing him, hoping uh, that it was going to come good. But your expectations of, of him delivering um, were probably pretty low. But, you know, at the end of the day, too, fucking good players have bad years sometimes. You know, well, saying- remember, the, the goey's second year was deplorable. And yeah, look, again, questionable, but his improvement has come on leaps and leaps and leaps and bounds um, from from that. And a lot of players have that blues year. Well, they're saying Stevenson's also, or he also struggled with hub life, and there might be attitude I reckon, problems. Yeah, and I said that all the way during the rant this year, but that that's, and, and I think you know, and you're going to probably hear a few more stories out of it because post the the season ending, um, Cameron came out and said that fucking he hated it. Uh, Grundy, I think, didn't say it himself, but Buck said it for him that he just didn't function well inside of that hub environment, and clearly that translated onto the field. Um, and Stevenson, I reckon, and I've said it during the the rant um, year. That, that, that he he clearly needs family around him um, during the first lockdown um, he moved out of where he was and went straight back home again I think you know if you're doing that and then you're uprooted and then sent um, away for three months plus that you're not going to see your family for him at his age and it's understandable was going to have um, a, probably a detrimental impact and I reckon it's a, it's a, it's a number of things that impacted his season but to fucking write him off based on that and they'd know the inside story um, would be an absolute tragedy just just as an aside, I, I saw Craig Hutchinson talking on one of those footy classified footy excerpts and he said one thing which I actually agree with, which I was shocked. But he was saying clubs should stop thinking about players for the season. They should think about like how they fit into a season and when you can bring him in. And he used the example like Basha Hawley at Richmond, missed like the first couple of months and they brought him in for the you know second half of the season. And then even someone like Grundy who struggled, I think the club should have said, fuck it, go take a month off yep. and then come back. You know, we don't need you for this period here. I mean, we need you, but we'll, you know, we'll sacrifice that. So you get yourself, you know, refreshed and we'll make do. We'll get some games in the camera. We'll get some games in the Cox. Uh, and then you can come back for the last quarter of the season and be, you know, ready to go. Why, and we've talked about this with Grundy, why they played in the whole season, I still don't know. You know, particularly that four games in 14 days in four states. And on Stevenson, he struggled with hub life. Now, look, none of us know, you know, what actually went on behind closed doors. But at first, can't we check TikTok? Oh, I don't know. Well, hang on, I'll check. Oh, I'll leave that to later. With someone like Stevenson, if he had issues with hub life, and he was rebelling or whatever the case might be, surely it's on the coaching staff to find a way to make that work for him because he's an individual with individual needs and a football club is made up of 40 players or whatever the case is next year and you've got 22 individuals in your team and they all are not going to respond to the same stuff. So surely it's up to Buckley and... Harvey and Skipworth and um, <laughs> Aunt Sanderson. How can they not inspire? But surely it's up to them to find a way to connect with him and get the best out of him. And if that's not going to work, and this is another thing too, I, I, if Stevenson was struggling with hub life and they could say, well, look, this is not working for him and he's obviously had the bad year of the glandular, the club should have just said, fuck it. Do you want to go? We'll, we'll let you go for the season. We'll let you go back home. Yep. Uh, why... But you'd almost there's probably also um, a bit of survivalist guilt amongst that if you do uproot yourself from a team structure and you feel you're letting them down. Um, 
I, that would be my guess that, that maybe they thought that was going to be a lot of uh, long term it may have been more destructive I, 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 I can't buy into that because there's no structure in this team <laughs> um, just on, uh, on a tangent for a second and I only caught the tail end of this um, on the radio the other day it was with the sports psychologist that Richmond employ um, and she also works with a number of um, uh, supercar racing drivers um, but she was talking about the way that Richmond approached their hub life and they they all sat down and spoke about it and decided to, to take this unified approach the way it was going to work, very supportive of each other. You know, kids um, being thrown off to, to other players to look after while they tried to do semblance of date nights and that sort of thing. And it helped keep them sort of sane and focused, if that made sense. And um, she was talking a little bit about some of the stuff that the race car drivers go through and how that they, um, outside of the sort of general hours that they interact with each other, that they've always got that ear that they can lend on when they're feeling doubtful or stressed or or anything like that. And, and it's not something, I know that we, I believe that we have one at Collingwood. It's not something, and I guess it's not that area that you would go out there and make public and divulge, but you'd seriously hope that they have that sort of support structure around um, the playing group and that, that that is a voice that's heard as well, that there's a balance here that has to be done around how you treat these players as, as individual human beings and how you want them to function inside of a team structure at the same time. I, I would sincerely hope that that's all done. Nathan Buckle, you can call me out as being wrong. I doubt we do that, and I'll tell you why. It's because this club is reactive and everything we've done in the last 10 years has been copying someone else and we've done nothing original, innovative. We just see what other people are doing. They become Apple. Yeah, well, there you go. And I look at the way the the team sort of wilted. Obviously, there were issues with players having issues with hub life and that's fine because other players and other clubs would have done that the same. But Collingwood obviously didn't find a way to cope and the issue is next year, this could still be something that's prevalent throughout the season. Uh, And... You know, I look at the 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 brains trust or the brains mistrust. It's like, why should any of us have confidence in where you're taking us? Because based on the raw data of ten year last ten years, we've had one decent year where you've lost the grand final, and it's like, well, who hasn't done that at Collingwood? Um, so why should we have any confidence? And then you go towards other things where you look at this club with this. You know, you said it. How many games this team is, or club has lost at the selection table? Mm. It's just bewildering. You know, we talk about the Grundy not being selected. You go to that Fremantle game where they decided, well, that's the night we'll give Ruffhead off and we'll play Magden and Mark Keane. And you think, well, isn't that a really inexperienced defence? Uh, and you do things like... There's nothing better when a shit side treats you with contempt. Well, you look at things like Tom Phillips, you know. I, Tom Phillips is a really handy midfielder in 18... Um, he sort of came down a bit last year, but then you look at this year, it's like, well, he's going to be playing as half forward. It's like, well, why would you think he's going to excel? And people go, oh, well, Dacos and all that are playing wing. Well, you can rotate players and all that sort of shit. And it's fine. All right, well, if you feel Phillips has no space for him on the wing, then j- he's not a half forward. Then just put him in the fucking reserves and bring up someone who's going to play a half forward role rather than, you know, trying to turn someone into something they're not. That's fine if you want to try it, but it was quite obvious really early that Phillips was struggling. Uh, Coxie to the Bulldogs. Yeah, I heard that one. I can't see that happening. That'll happen tomorrow, Ben. <laughs> uh, potential trades. All those, some of these players have, you know, Ben Brown's picked Melbourne, but would you have taken him at Collingwood? <sighs> the, the problem still comes down to, look, I think we definitely need a key forward. Um, no matter what, um, it just really just feels like no matter who you put there and how good they are, with the way that we butchered the ball going inside 50, it really wouldn't make a world of difference. Maybe something would, would structure them up. I, look, I, I was a big fan of Ben Brown a couple of years ago, and based on that, I probably would have rolled the dice on him if he came cheap. But again, I just think there's more problems there than now just plugging that one gap. So that's going to apply to a lot of his swords. Jack Gunston. Yeah, no. Uh, Peter Wright. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about that. How old is he? He's, he's pretty young. He's only about, I don't know, I could check. But, but is he a Ford or a Ruckman? He's, he's, he's a Ruck that they're playing Ford and everyone's claiming he's a, he's a Ford. Look, I mean, again, that's one of those speculative things. He's obviously probably going to come cheap. Um, Gold Coast, did they play much this year? No, he didn't play at all. Well, that uh, <laughs> it should tell you something. But, you know, look, again... It's, He's 24. If you're going to go this route um, and, and gamble, at least these are some prospective names. That's being polite. Well, I actually compared the stats of Wright and um, Cox, and they're really identical. Oh, then stick with Coxie, then. Um, 
Cox is a little bit older. Wright gets a few more possessions. Coxie takes a lot more contested marks. That might be the way we play. And uh, Coxie got a lot more tap outs, but he might be getting a lot more time in the ruck. I don't know anything about Wright. You know, as a ruckman, he might mature later than, you know, uh, typical midfielder or whatever. Um, but I really hate this philosophy that we've adopted over the years of finding Ruckman and going, well, you're going to be our forward. You know, you've done it with Coxie. You've, you're doing it with Darcy Cameron. Um, previously, you know, you're trying to do it with either Jared Blitz or Grundy. You haven't fucking did it years ago. Shane McManara. It's like, go just get a key position player. Well, that would be ultimately my response to Look, and, and just thinking about it then, if, if you're going to spend next year treading water again and you're not going to contend, which is all likelihood probably going to happen, um, invest in a, in, a, in a good kid with potential forward capabilities in the draft and, and, and look, you know, look at the Kings and stuff that have come up this year. I mean, granted, they're not going to be there every year, but I just don't see the sense in the stopgap stuff well, at, unless it is um, that we... And either go, yeah, 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 no, I won't get it. Go. Well, well, with the Kings, um, you know, I've always called for more to play up forward. I actually compared the stats and more actually pretty identical to what the Kings are delivering at the same time. That, that when Moore is at the same age, they all got about 24 goals in the season. Like, admittedly, you know, this year is a bit shorter and all that sort of stuff. But if you look at the forward line that Moore had to play under or play in, you know, that wasn't helping anyone. He, he for me, is still the answer up forward. I know Colin won't do it. Do you think... What about Tom McDonald from Melbourne? Um, he's another one that's been struggling to get game time there, isn't he? Yeah. I mean, he was a bit of a presence a couple of years ago. How old is he? He's still... 28. 20, yeah. Oh, again, it's a stopgap, isn't it? You know, isn't this what Cameron was meant to be? And, you know, if you if you get um, McDonald or Wright into this side and you keep Cox here, are you going to play Grundy, Wright, Cox, Cameron, all these guys at the one time? It's never going to happen. So what are you trying to do? Are you just going to keep rotating them through? What, what's the plan? What would you do with those guys if you had them guys on your list? I'd do list three of them. <laughs> I, but you see where I'm going. You're, yeah. just, you, 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 you're making your list um, even more imbalanced by having top well, heavy you, stocks. You go back to 2010. All right, so that's the only successful year you can draw on. You look at the, the balance of the list. You had four genuine key positions, as four and a half in terms of Brown, Reed, Cloak, Dawes, and Lee Brown. So Nathan Brown and Lee Brown. And Lee Brown played as a smaller ruck. He was actually quite quick for his size. You know, remembering that, um, oh, geez, I forgot who, but he outran the Bulldogs midfield in the qualifying final, chased him down. So he was pretty quick. And we always knew that when Brown went into the ruck, we were not going to do as well with tap outs, but that was the sacrifice we made to get Jolly some rest time. Now they've gone this other way of like more than 200 centimetres. So you got like a really tall uh, full back and people go, he's not full back. It's enough. Like, he's full back. He always fucking ends up full back. Um, and then you get guys like Cox and who's 211 and Cameron who moves well for his size but again it's for his size and it's like the moment this falls apart you sort of fall apart in the final against Geelong you suddenly expose how top heavy you are mm. and there's no flexibility there and if you look at that final or if you look at any of those matches where we played Cameron and Grundy if somebody like um, let's say Trelaw went down or Adams or you know, one of the running players went down then suddenly you've lost the rotation in the mids and there's nothing you can do with those tall players. They can't start playing midfield unless Buckley was adventurous enough, and we know he's not. Unless Buckley was adventurous enough to say, well, you know what, I'll play Cameron in the ruck and I'll play Grundy at ruck rover. Mm-hmm. We know he's not going to be lateral enough to do something like that. So you've got an extremely unbalanced side and it's one of these things, when it works, great, but when it doesn't work, there's not a, a lot of leeway to find or to rebalance the side and to find a new setup that's going to actually help you in whatever game you're playing. So, I mean, I, I look at the side and just think, I don't, I don't know what the fuck it's going to be. I don't know what the fuck it is. If you go to the, the, the coaches, so they're going to go yet again with Buckley, Robert Harvey, <laughs> and Brenton Sanderson. Because <laughs> there'll be so many fresh ideas there. And this is one thing, you know, they let go of um, Gary Hocken because of COVID. I think Richard... Did he have it? I think he didn't want to get it from Collingwood. But uh, because of COVID cuts. And you look at um, Richmond and Geelong found ways to keep assistant coaches. You would have felt like the Collingwood would have said, well, they've heard Robert Harvey's message for the last 28 years and they've heard Sanderson's message for the last 20 years. Let's get rid of one of these guys and we'll keep Hocking. And the players love Hocking too. 
that coaching staff, fuck it, I'll say it, is toxic in terms of we've had the same problems for how long? And we don't see any remedies. And then even if we see like a makeshift remedy, we know that there'll be no longevity in that going forward. So, you know, that our two weeks of finals sums up the Buckley era of Collingwood 2018 aside. You get that one great game, you go, oh, fuck, look at us, we're unbeatable. And then the next week you get this shit performance. It's like, oh, what the fuck happened? There's no, we don't sustain what the fuck we're doing. And the team we're putting out there just seems very fragile in terms of structure and executing whatever game plan they're trying to play. I don't know why they've gone back to this slow, shitty, stagnant game plan. I mean, it, it boggles the mind that they use this from 214 to 217. So that's four years. They almost won the grand final in 18 and then they went back to it in 19 and they went back to it in 20. And it's like, at what point do you concede it's not going to work for you? Um, probably in 2038. You know, I, the one, so let's look at this, all right? How many people do you know are now in, in an uproar about moving forward with, with the people in charge? I'm not just talking about Buckley. I'm talking about Aguirre, Buckley, Derek Hine, everyone in key positions at Colin. But how many people do you know are now clamoring for change? Other people apart from us? Yeah. Because we've been calling this for a while now. Yeah. Um, I think there is uh, an unrest amongst the natives. Didn't, didn't you ring up SEN and said Buckley's getting better and better as a coach? And... Oh, no. Fuck. And this is the problem. And we've talked about this. I actually should probably preface this and explain what we're... Um, oh, yeah. I, I, someone, this... ran, someone rang up SEN. Oh, I, I was driving and yeah. listening to SEN. And, and I mean, there were two calls that stood out um, from, from Collingwood supporters. Um, I can't name them because um, I shouldn't be that cruel to people. But one was saying that um, we have to be patient with bucks. And you're sitting there and like, in, in, there's not too many things in, in life um, that make you want to drive off the road. Uh, but that's one of them. And you're sitting there thinking, oh, for fuck, what, 10 years wasn't enough? You know, the, generally the guy was probably right because I often find that coaches are better in their second decade. <laughs> Because that happens fucking so often. And, and But this is the bewildering aspect of, of the majority, of I think, of our supporter base, is it's all rah, 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 boo, rah, love, without applying any friggin' logic at all uh, to, to, to a situation. And the other one that really grated on me, and, and, and I suppose you sort of circumvented, uh, circumvented? Yeah, that sounds good. Circumvented it before um, with one of your statements, uh, is a person's rung in and said, we can't expect to make grand finals and win them every year um, they're very hard to get you can't be like Richmond Geelong Brisbane Hawthorne over the last 20 years and you're thinking you just contradicted your statement you can apparently do it as long as you're not Collingwood you can have that expectation and sides can do it now and like I don't expect to get up there every year either but however though let, let me stop you just for a real, let me interject so we've made 42 grand finals so we're pretty good in terms of getting there not every year but like every second two or well, two and a yeah. half years so we do get there. We're fifteen twenty-seven too, I think. So we get there. So don't give me this shit. Don't expect to get there. We get there. It's the fucking winning of them that's the issue. And the reason we don't win them is because there's no plan. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, the culture is something I've ranted at all. We've both ranted about and we just ranted about it earlier. Is you have this real soft mentality of how great are we? How fucking magnificent are we? You look at the clubs who are winning flags. Richmond's ruthless. You look at the players in Richmond's side, like Trent Cotchin. Trent Cotchin plays this sort of mongrel type of game now. I'm not saying that to his detriment. You know, he, but he leads by example. You don't see that at Collingwood from anyone other than Taylor Adams occasionally. You know, They don't play angry. They don't play focused. They don't play with this hostile intensity. They don't play with this win at all cost mentality that Hawthorne exhibited when they won free, which Richmond exhibited, you know? And people go, oh, Richmond's got dusty and all that sort of stuff. Well, great. You know, we've got players there who can win games, but we don't use them to the best of their capacity. And we definitely, this fucking game plan benefits nobody other than the cheap stats of kicking sideways and backwards and around and handballing and all that sort of shit. Let me ask you something around that then. What do you think next year is going to be about? Now, we're, we're doing this prefacing, um, whatever it is, the next 16 years of trade and draft. Trade millennium, yeah. Is that how long it fucking goes for? Yeah. Um, so we don't know what, what our plans are, and obviously post that we'll come back and, and say, no, nah, no, nah, we were right or, or whatnot. But it reeks at the moment to me 
the we are looking desperate um, <laughs> desperate next year but with the view to borderline win enough games so that, that, that Eddie can announce that Bucks gets a, an extension on his contract. I cannot, uh, Do you think that that's a possibility? Yes. Can I... Um, you can cut this out if it's, I'm speaking out of turn and I'll be oblique about it. So a few years ago, we had a mentality that we needed to make the finals because of all the backlash against Buckley. And so somebody, I won't mention who he is, recruited the likes of Lyndon Dunn and Daniel Wells and Chris Main and tried to shore up the side with a top end of senior talent. The money ball approach. Yeah. And it didn't work out. Now, that also shows you the um, the way the club has a reflex to criticism. I think what's going to happen next year is you go back a couple of years to, I think, 2017 when that backlash was really building up against Buckley and the incumbents and... It seemed to asphyxiate the team from playing free-flowing football. Back at that time, I don't recall the invective from the supporters to be to the extent that we're experiencing now. Yeah. People want change. What's going to happen next year is if it starts to go pear-shaped, there's going to be a lot of pressure on the club. There's going to be a lot of pressure around appointments with Buckley. There's going to be a lot of pressure on Maguire. There's going to be a lot of pressure on players, which is probably going to contribute to the... And the, the side... Sorry, the, the reality is the side doesn't have the mentality to cope with that shit. They will implode. Now, if they win and they keep winning, there's going to be that sense of, well, there's really only one thing that's going to rescue you from, you know, being fired. Now, that's a flag. Can they win the flag this side? I... I the competition, I think, is really, really still sub- substandard. If they recruit well, which is sort of funny, um, <laughs> and they don't lose, you know, nine players, which it looks like they're going to do. You know, it looks like they're going to lose Phillips and Trelaw and you know, possibly Stevens and all that sort of shit. I don't see what, what they're doing next year other than treading water and believing they're actually building for the future. And whoever they bring into the club, if they bring in Tom McDonald, then they obviously believe they're going to contend next year. Well, it's the same with all the Jetta rumours and stuff like that too. That They obviously still think they're in contention. But the, and this If go- those rumours are true. Well, we'll find out soon enough. But the pressure that's going to build on this squad and this club as a whole from you... Firstly, opposition supporters, they're relishing the shit that's going on now around Trelaw and all that sort of stuff. And I had a Carlton mate say to me, it's fucking disgraceful the way you're treating him. Um, which I actually agree. You know, well, you made. Well, he yeah. chose Carlton. Yeah. Well, and then you, you don't look, expect kindness. No, oh, kill him with kindness. Um, but going forward, I don't know what Collingwood's plan is, and I don't know what's going to salvage their incumbent powers who be powers that be outside of a flag. And I think they're nowhere near a flag. They yeah. would need quite a bit of luck to win a flag. It's going to be telling um, over the next sixty-eight years of um, this trade period. Um, what road we're taking because if we cut um, I suppose you can include Cox um, if Trelaw's moved on if Stevenson was traded out you're flagging a rebuild surely and not just a mini rebuild you're, you're doing a three or four year rebuild and it'd have to well probably three years would be enough because you then you've still got viability left in Grundy and, and more and the like if, to have another crack you couldn't be a prolonged one if, if they're going to rebuild to that extent, if they're actually going to get rid of Trelaw and um, Stevenson and they're not getting in talent of around that age, if they're just going to the draft or whatever the case is, they might as well trade out Grundy because mm. there's no point in him being there because he's not going to be there during the successful period. And one of the things um, someone pointed out to me today, which I was really surprised, that Travis Clark's only 33. I thought he was like 36, 37. He could still be playing. He, if he'd had his career at Richmond, he'd probably still be there to his day. Yep, no, I agree on that one. You know, so side bottom won't be there. Pendles definitely won't no. be there. How? Yeah, he's surely only got another year or two left in well, him. We don't, know, we don't know how Howe will come back from that. Well, that's, that's, the, yeah, that's the big question, Mark. You know, and then you're going to rely on guys like Will Kelly and all that. And you haven't pumped games. I'm still shocked that this year that they didn't pump games into Bianco and Rantel and even give Scharenberg more of a chance. Uh, it's really I, again we don't know what the message coming out of the club is because the club I don't think knows itself I think they're sitting there going what, what are we doing what are we doing and I think it's almost like you're not plotting to get to attain anything in this period you're just going to be picking at the scraps well I think one of the things too is I'll, I'll speak again you can edit this out if you need to oh fuck it 
Yeah, fuck it. Uh, 209, the intel I had after we got smashed in the prelim was that Malthouse was really devastated because he thought they were genuinely a chance against Shalong and they just got smashed. And then Malthouse himself says they needed the time to find a way to beat Geelong. And they devised the press, which apparently Buckley made. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Is he going to need other tricks then? No. Most coaches only have like one trick. Um, now you look at the way we beat West Coast, it was like, oh shit, this, we've got some life left in this side. And then the way Geelong hammered us, it's like we're this far behind everyone. And I think they actually have no gauge on where they genuinely stand. No, oh, especially after this year. Because Yeah, because of this year, because you never knew what you were getting. But this is one of the problems too, is you should seriously, and I understand clubs are up and down and all that sort of shit, particularly this year, but seriously, you should know what you're going to be getting from your fucking side week in, week out. And the Buckley sides, you know, and I've defended him for a long time, but the Buckley sides, 2008 on the side, have been up and down. Last year, they were doing it within the game. They were playing that shit football then for seven minutes to come alive and kick five goals and win a game. Um, I reckon they genuinely don't know where they stand or how to would go forward. And if these... The scuttlebutt around Trelaw and Stevenson and all that is true, they actually have a bigger problem. They don't even know how to fucking manage their playing list so that these people are content and want to build something with this club. This is not... You know, look at Richmond. They said they took pay cuts to get Lynch in and all that. There's a club that's focused and wants to mm. do something. This club's not focused because for a very, very simple fucking reason, Eddie Maguire, it's because you have no vision for where you're fucking going. No. no one has a vision outside of tomorrow. And you think after 20 years, you might have actually learned how to develop one? Well, I would have thought that, you know, after that 210 flag, they would have said, well, this is what we're going to do in the next five years. But they derailed that. They, you know, had to rebuild or decide to rebuild, whatever the case might be. And then they've recruited poorly. The club's in a fucking mess in terms of list management. They've got a, this list together now. And it's still a very, you know, as I call it, it's a Tom Hafey type of list. It's got a lot of journeymen. It's got a lot of players playing out of position. I said before, your ruckman is a, uh, your full forward is a ruckman. Your centre half forward is a guy you rookie to be a defender. You know, you're, you're putting pieces in to make, you know, the, the, do as the best as you can because you don't have the genuine pieces. Again, I don't know why they didn't recruit Jake Riccardi. I don't know why they haven't targeted the key positioners previously. <laughs> In which decade? It's, you know, and then they've, then they've moneyballed guys like Roughhead and, and, and Lyndon Dunn. And obviously those guys have played well for us. But again, it shows you how reactive they are because they don't, they haven't built that site with a vision of going, well, this is going to be our best 18 for next year. This is what we see it. Obviously other players might come up. They might improve. Other players might drop off. You don't know what's going to happen. But surely you should have an idea of the side you want to move forward through the league, you know, in every coming season. And, you know, I recall I was, again, talking out of turn. I recall I was told years ago that Alistair Clarkson for Hawthorne had the, his best Hawthorne side up on the whiteboard and under each position he had three names for, like, replacements. And that was what he'd do if there was injuries or whatever the case is. Succession planning? Well, succession planning for the team. Collingwood doesn't know what the fuck they're doing from game to game. <laughs> You'd like to think that, wouldn't you? Well, not, they're proving it. Well, out of 10, how fucking, how enraged are you or how apathetic or how disgusted are you going forward with this club? I've got a lot of apathy this year. It's, um, and look, it hasn't been a great year, obviously, with everything that's happened. So naturally, your, your negativity is, is skyrocketing. Um, but I don't see, you know, when I think back to, um, from probably seven onwards, 2007 onwards, you started to see something begin to evolve that, you know, it was exciting to go to the football. It was exciting to see these young kids come on. You know, when, when kids came into that side, they knew what their role was to be played. So they generally picked up the pace pretty quickly. Um, and then you ended up winning a flag. I just don't see that now. I just see that we... It, it's like, and I said it to the other day, that, that it's almost like 2018 is the worst possible thing that could have happened to us because it's deluded everyone into resetting the playing board. Yeah. Um, we almost, and I don't think any Hollywood side can, can ever say this, they almost snatched an unlikely, ridiculous year flag. And we didn't, um, which would come as a shock. Um, but we still thought we were going to be up there at abouts and we've gone back to the same status quo almost. Um, I just don't see where we're... We're getting worse each season. 
I don't see where we're going to improve with with the way things currently are. And that's not so much about the playing list as well as the fact that I think the administration stale, the coaching panel is stale. There's a lot of change required at, at Collingwood. It's that statement that I've always been saying that uh, everything wrong with Collingwood is Collingwood itself at the moment. You know, could you not look at your history with, with favourite sons and look at all the success you've got out of it and not learn anything? It's all the same mistakes that we keep being insistent on repeating I just don't think the club it's just so full of itself that it can't acknowledge its failings and fix them it just thinks doing boo-rahs and, and rolling up a bunch of sheep is, is, is going to be enough to, to get it through another year and it's it's a model that's fucking look it's worked for probably a hundred years of, of, of the club's existence the club's failing to evolve with the rest of the competition oh, I the think club the, failed to evolve from seven years ago the, the other sides are just reading the play and reading the way things work so much better than us and we're still it just feels like we're constantly treading water you, you go back to the 1920s and 1930s they lost players like Des Father Girl who was apparently very much like Peter Dacos Ron Todd who was, was a, he kicked you know 300 goals in three seasons I think it was they left because they weren't getting paid at the before the prime of their careers, it'd be like Tony Lockett leaving St Kilda, and you can rinse repeat that scenario for the next six decades. Yeah. And they, and they, yeah, and that's what they've done. I mean, they got to the point in the seventies where you know Len Thompson and um, Des Tudman had an argument with the board because they were paying some interstate recruit more than not paying their captain and vice captain. And obviously, it's not all about payment and all that sort of shit. But the reality is, you have a very myopic view of the club and the way you're moving forward. And, you know, you do things like... The reality the, the, the reality is with Maltas, they should have given him another two years after... Oh, two definitely. Ten, at least. And and I'll say this, you know, and it'll be argument about whether the, the club would have done anything or not. Even if they hadn't done anything and the club started to slide, then they could have made a change and nobody would have said anything. The players wouldn't have said anything. And Buckley then could have inherited the list, as Dane Swan says in his own book. Buckley could have then... He imposed his own vision on the list rather than taking what was Malthouse's vision and pretty much disassembling it for whatever reasons. Yeah. Only Collingwood can kill Collingwood. So, again, that goes back to lack of vision because the club doesn't know what it's doing from moment to moment. They just think, well, we'll do this now and then we'll deal with the consequences later. Well, all the consequences are now amassing to fall like a pile of shit on top of you. Speaking to someone else the other week uh, and just saying, like, you can break supporters into three groups. There's the lemmings who will follow on regardless. The majority. Yep. I, I'm talking about now, not in general. So just you know, and then there's people like us who are just thinking, well, this club's fucked. You need you need to change. The dickheads. Yeah. And then there's the people in the middle uh, middle who are pretty much responding to whatever's happening at that given time. Now, generally, the, those middle people who are responding, they will tend to give them some leeway. You know, okay, we got to a finals, it's good effort and blah, 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 and all that sort of shit. But what I'm seeing from that middle group is this club's fucked, it needs a change. Would you think the best thing for this club right now is if, hypothetically, Joe Blow fronted a board challenge and said, I'm going to go get this coach, we're going to do this, we're going to review every position, and that's the only way to move forward, and that person started saying exactly what we're saying. The things wrong with this club are the things that have been wrong for 70, 80 years. We want to move into the future like Richmond's done, like Hawthorne's done, like Carlton's trying to do. We don't want to fall behind because what's going to happen is if we fall behind in this league, you know, you can sit in the bottom like Melbourne's done, like Carlton did in the early 2000s. It doesn't guarantee you success because again, it goes back to what I said. You've got to have a bit of luck like finding a player later in the draft that's going to be a gun. Um, which I think Carlton's done this time around, but it's just whether they've left their charge too late with guys like Chris. But do you think that would be the best thing for the club for someone just to emerge and go, fuck this, this needs change. It's not going to, nothing will change with the incumbents. The, the trouble is, is, I don't think a challenger is going to do anything at the moment because the cult of Eddie is just too strong. Um, you need him to put his hand up and say that, that I can't do this anymore. Or, do you think he's going to say that? No. Um, but that's what needs to, to virtually happen to, to affect change. And then, then that's not... Look, Eddie's been a great servant of the club. Um, 20 years, though, in the same place is just too long for anyone. Um, 10 years is too long. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's what... I mean, one of the first things I'd do would be change the constitution for fixed-term presidencies. Because that way, I think, when you know that there is a, an, an end on the horizon, it forces you to probably think better on your feet and be a lot more adaptive and think about those short-term consequences than, than this absurd long game that just keeps 
um, never evolving and keeps changing every eight seconds. I, I think you need some structure around that. And, and then from there, you've got to then look at the internals of the club and then start rebuilding that. It's not so much about rebuilding a football list anymore. I mean, what, the, what does the club stand for these days? What is it? What, what, what does Collingwood say to you? Collingwood is now a football club of uh, a, a, a poor performance. It's um, an AFLW club that never really took off. It's, you know, it showed moments of, of getting better, but in a competition where everyone was starting with, with a clean ledger and a, and a checkbook should have gotten you a flag, I would have thought. Um, we haven't done anything there. The VFLW side won a flag, I suppose. That's, yep. that's a, 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 a freak occurrence. Now you've got a netball side. Do they do anything? Well, they apparently let your laws behind the The Collingwood Warriors, well, how are they going? Oh, they go, they're going really off that Vital yeah. sponsorship. Well, I was about to make a Vital gag. Thanks for ruining that. Um, but yeah, but that's the, the point. Is about what is, it that, what is it that Collingwood says to you? What does it mean now? It's just this amalgam of... of, of of black and white stripes and all of them are vying to be successful and none of them seem to have a, a, an idea of how to get there. I think you've got to take a step back and fix your core business and then you build your brand around that. But I don't think we're going to take that thing. No, we, we just seem to be, the, the fact that we want to flood the brand just seems to be enough because again, it goes back to that whole thing about you, you, you've got the masses behind you, let's make the masses work for us. It just seems to be the only approach, but making any of those entities successful, it just almost seems like it's, it'd be a nice to have, not that it's something well, it's, that we're striving. I mean, I'm sure they're not that dumb that they, yeah. they wouldn't be thinking that they want success out of all this stuff. But it's just like, the, where, where's they, your focus? I mean, Adam Guy, I'm pretty sure, said that winning premierships isn't everything. So I know Malthouse said that at one point. Um, Did they? Yeah, I've been told, uh, so I could be wrong. Like, but they didn't Flag schmags, he reckon. <laughs> but it was like there's more to a football club than just winning flags. No, there's not. Uh, and that's what, what, I... what, what are you in this? Co- do we drive Formula One cars every other weekend just to see who finishes uh, 17th? Yeah. One of my issues with this club... Only one? Yeah, I was thinking that too. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Um, have, you, have you got a bullet point list? For about 100 years, you really operated on this working class mentality where we represent the working class and all that sort of stuff. And then Eddie moved them to the South Bank or North Bank, wherever the fuck they are. <laughs> okay. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing him for that. He wanted to upgrade and move and evolve them and all that sort of shit. But they lost, I think, part of their identity that in doing that. Now, I don't think the working class identity really fits anymore. No, it's definitely not. And particularly yeah. in the the communist AFL, because <laughs> um, everyone's meant to be equal and all that sort of shit. They need to forge a new identity. The Orwellian AFL. What? The Orwellian one. Yeah. They, they need to all forge... clubs are created equal, except some are more equal than others. Yeah, you know, the clubs who want to succeed, they need to forge an identity. And they should have done this under Eddie from 20 years ago. And I, this is what I really hope to going to the 202 grand final. I was thinking, this will be the rebirth of the club before we win this. And then walking away, it's like, it's the same old fucking Collingwood. They need to forge a new identity for the club that means success. And that means setting goals to achieve, like Richmond did. It means getting ruthless in the fucking way you oversee the club and the club's operations. Because, you know, they might come back to me and go, oh, we've made money. It's like, well, it's about more than making money. Your drafting's been shit for... 10 years your list management's been shit you know if you trade out someone like Stevenson he was one of your few draft successes in the last five years they're talking about you know trading out Hoskin Elliott and all that sort of stuff it's like well okay I think you guys are trying to pursue something and you don't even know what it is anymore and that's because there's no vision there that leads to no identity and the club has no identity it's just this hollow entity now um, this is one of my Richmond friends called it years ago he just called it North Bank he goes it just lost whatever it was the club needs to fucking stand for something it doesn't stand for anything and they need to get some genuine ruthlessness in there which is why I think Taylor Adams should be a captain next year no disrespect to Pendles but he's never been that robbo of a player who will run through someone or you know Nick Maxwell had that you know Tony Shaw had that in different I mean to a lesser extent but in a different way but he was a ruthless player Pendles is a champion but he's never had that if you get in all way I'll run free like Luke Hodge might have or even like Trent Cotchin's done so they need to change the identity of the club and they need to get totally focused and serious about success yep. not fucking profits not soup kitchens sorry not um, extraneous uh, sporting organisations like their netball, netball side and shit like that what about the badminton side though oh fuck you know the ping pong side 
it's just a club to me doesn't know what they're doing from day to day and the bigger issue going back to one of your earlier questions about next year is they're going to be pushed into a corner and they're just going to go in survival mode and hope for the best and try Hail Marys and what I really hope is the p- coaches and all that aren't sitting there going well let's trade out Stevenson and we'll get this guy and that'll fix things and then Stevenson goes has some glorious 10 year career elsewhere because you guys were so short sighted and intent on trying to find a way out of this malaise that you've you know created for yourselves that you start seeing things subjectively um, so I don't know I, I really don't have a lot of enthusiasm for next year no as I said look, it just, you, the overall sense at the moment now is, is that it's just going to be more treading water and yeah. I want to see change I want to see some structure some planning going to this and I want to see that translate into results now I, look I can be patient if you know that is already um, well if it's been implemented or it's going to be implemented you can sit back and say well you give them you know a season or two for it to gel I just don't know what it is now it's just throwing jigsaw piece puzzles up in the air and hoping they land down there's a picture of the Mona Lisa there that's just how it feels I just I I might be concerned you're just pissing away I mean Grundy's the one now but you know you go back to the beginning of Buckley's tenure and I blame Buckley specifically but you had guys in their prime, or entering their prime, not even in their prime, but entering their prime like Daisy and Pendles and um, Cloak and then Swan was a little bit older and all that. And really, they just spent five, six years doing nothing. I mean, Daisy left. But, you know, Pendles got to play, what, in four years of just nothing sides running out there, finishing it's, it's, bottom five, six. It's Cloak. A, it's a waste of talent. You know, Travis Cloak, like I said, he's 33, you, you know. Um, they and Swan... He never seemed the same under Buckley, and he played about another four years, another four or five years, and just the wasting talent. I understand that happens. You know, Bob Skilton only played in one final. You look at someone like Cade Simpson at Carlton played three hundred games. I don't know how many finals All he played. Losses. Yeah. You know, it's just apparently he sits at home on the weekends and like if something good happens, he pours Gatorade on himself. <laughs> well, I understand that not everyone's going to play in successful eras. Not everyone's going to be like. You know, Cochin who gets to play in free flag. Sometimes it's just, you know, it's just luck to be in the right club at the right side. There's plenty of average players or okay players who've played in flags. But one of my issues is our players are wasting their talent because we have no idea what the fuck we're doing and nothing that's getting done inspires us with confidence. No, I think that's that it is it in a nutshell. Any final thoughts? Um no, I think that we've pretty much covered it all. Um, I look, it's now really, it's it's a, you know, in a lot of ways it's up to the club, um, and and as I said, the next couple of years of this trade period are going to be very. It's going to tell a massive story. Yeah, you know, it's going to be a massive, massive story. Um, we're on reduced this next year. I think is it still reduced? Um, yeah, they just salaries. Don't... Or, we're, uh, or enough of when, oh, maybe it's know, not yeah. sure no one knows look and no one even knows what the season's going to look like next year whether we'll have a season um, hopefully the way things are progressing that they, they will and there'll be six people laid out into the ground each week um, but even so if we still can't get crowds to, to the football and it's still played here it's still going to be a diluted season in a lot of ways and how we fit inside that and how we respond and how we function is going to be very telling and a lot of it's going to be on the back in the next couple of weeks in the trade period let me ask you one final question to ponder we're at free free next year at round six oh we'll give him another three years and Colin would announce the re-signing Buckley for another year well I reckon that's that, as I said I think that's a scenario that it's pretty much look I've, I've always look unless Eddie goes and I don't think Eddie's going to go next year Eddie will never sack Buckley um, Buckley has to come out I think Buckley's been given the mandate to decide when he um, thinks he's finished he'll come out and say he's finished we're not getting any sense of that this year so he still thinks he's capable of leading him to a to a premiership um, my biggest fear would be if by round six we're six zero and sitting on top of the ladder that pen will come out pretty damn quick yeah I'll, I if you look at um, most premiers they don't dominate the season. They tend to ease into the season and then come up and... Well, it's like Richmond. It's, it's, a, it's a marathon, not a, not a sprint. Yeah. So if we're six zip, then I think I'll just cash in my membership. And... <laughs> Last question, actually. Should the club... And not this is, isn't specifically aimed at Collingwood, but we'll just talk about Collingwood. Should the club... Fold? Well, that's a yes. I don't need hypothetical for that. 
Should the club discount memberships next year, given this year was just the donation? Well, I've already um, um, heard that um, prices are the same. I'll declare like I'm an AFL member. I, I'm a, still a social club member. I um, kept that going on the Collingwood side, and, and that's really such a negligible amount. I've, I've not really noticed. But the thing is, um, the AFL um, were in a lot of contact with its members this year, and and offered, I think, about three different ways you could approach yeah. your membership, which was either a full refund, um, you could take um, a percentage discount on next year if you paid the full amount this year, or you could defer it with no penalty to your longevity of your membership. Because yeah, I'm a, paid absentee. Uh, yeah, so. yeah. Um, and then you're back to normal next year. And when you looked at it, uh, you had options in choosing what value is. Now, look, it's a horrible thing what we went through this year, um, With the restaurant flag. Yeah, but I think it's... It, yeah. But it's good that at least that, that some of that stuff is... Look, you want value. It's not just so much about throwing money at an entity and saying, I get a $3 scarf. Jeez, I'm feeling good about it. You want some return on that money. And we're not talking like it's $300 a year. It's close to 1000 I think, for yeah. a full, full membership, which is a reasonable chunk of money for what we get served up. You want to get something back on that. And the fact that they didn't... Give, I don't know, what do they... Did they give discounts... This year or anything, but there's certainly nothing, nothing went into next year. It's back to status quo. Now that's admirable of Collingwood, considering that nobody else knows what the world's going to look like. We're we're in a recession, a recession that's probably going to go on for quite a few more months before there's any growth. Getting out of this COVID stuff just opens up probably the, the next phase of how economically woeful the world could be for a year or two. And the club's already decided that everyone should be paying full membership fees without knowing what the season looks like. I think it's a little bit jumping the gun. I don't know how well that's been received. I've read a few angsty people around it that they feel a little bit, you know, we've supported you, where's the support for us? And I think that's also getting back to something else that we probably could have discussed, is is that I think the club has really distanced itself between um, the supporter base and their wallets, that the, the... there's no and look, you can't have seventy thousand people over around for a barbecue or anything like that. But you just don't get a sense that you're made to feel special for being a Collingwood member anymore. You're just viewed upon as a as a credit card number. Um, you get sent some little trinkets, a hat, and some scarves, and you go and watch your team um, kick a ball around. I, I just don't think that they've they've lost. Or, no, I don't think it. I think they have lost. That, that sense of well, you've said it previously, contact with, with their they, um, paying membership base. They constantly fail to read the room. Oh, well, yeah. Fuck and me. that goes to, um, I think it was about Friday, where they released, they changed the banner on their Facebook page. It had a picture of Pendles, Steph Chiachi, and I don't know who their netball captain is, sorry. Um, I think that's True Law's wife. <laughs> um, sorry to the netball captain. Uh, and had the words imprinted on those three players made by many and it was quite entertaining reading the comments <laughs> which went into oh well this is a great attitude you're getting rich law and blah 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 what was the meme that came around Un- uh, made by many undone by a few unmade by a few oh, that's it yeah, yeah. so check that, that what, on the what, Collingwood what, rampage why didn't they put that up yeah they should put that up I, honestly and not just talking about Collingwood any club who doesn't do this you should fucking discount your membership next year we had no choice in this and it's not like an absentee membership because if I was going to be an absentee member, I'd, that'd be my choice willingly. Yeah. I was forced into that because I just couldn't get to a game this year. You've got probably Buckley's chance, no pun intended, yeah. of going to 80,000, 90,000 crowd games next year. It's not well, going to happen. Well, the cricket, the, the uh, Boxing Day test is limiting it to 25,000. So that's in the stadium that fits four times that amount. So they'll... The, There'll definitely be, you know, crowd control next year. And then you've got to still factor in the possibly what if there's outbreaks and, you know, there's other lockdowns, which, you know, it's just still a chance and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, no, the club should the clubs should turn around and go, okay, we are going to discount it or we're going to do something for you outside of giving you a free dollar scarf, maybe some sweatshop. I think it's a fucking joke if they don't. And for Collingwood given they're at this precarious state where there are so many outraged supporters, so many indignant members, so many frustrated people associated with the black and white, slapping him in the face yet again. I don't know. I mean, that's like, you know, maybe put up a fucking another meme saying, hey, 
why don't you pay five years membership and get ahead of it? <laughs> it's it's really ridiculous. I, I, the MCC members are apparently discounted, so they took it into consideration. I don't think we've heard anything from the AFL ourselves, have we? I no one's heard anything from the no. AFL since Roswell. They have <laughs> fucking done nothing. I mean, no one knows the size of lists, the salary caps or anything. You know. Oh, and actually, before I forget, I mean, I've, I've had about 19 <laughs> last things, just like Colombo. Just one last thing. <laughs> How uplifted were you by the sight of Josh Dacos collecting his Goal of the Year award on crutches? <laughs> it's just, it was just like uh, the cosmic ballet continues. Um, look, you know, players go under the knife and that sort of thing, but it, it was just classic Collingwood, really, wasn't it? You know, everyone else who wins an award walks out the stage, does a bit of a heel clip. Um, Dacos comes out dragging what's left of his legs behind <laughs> uh, on crutches. Uh, you think, oh, yeah, no, nah, it's poetic. Yeah. Any final thoughts? No, no, no. Um, let's just see what the next couple of weeks holds and uh, we'll be back after that and have a look at what um, transpired, I guess, and uh, uh, what we probably sort of foresaw as being um, a concern and then we'll talk about where we go from there, I guess. Just like Guns and Roses. Mm, mm, anyway, mm. we'll speak again in the future, for it's in the future <laughs> that we will see. Griswold. <laughs> All right, later. All right, catch.